Thank you for coming to our webinar, uh, From Words to Wellness, Exploring the Impact of Expressive Writing. My name is Nora Barnett. I'm the Health Professionals Outreach Specialist with Region 6 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine. I'm going to be your host for today's session. Some information to cover before we get started. All attendees have been muted to reduce background noise, uh, but we do welcome your questions and comments at any time. Please use the chat box to share your comments um, and the Q&A to submit any questions you have for our speaker. Miles Diaz-Castell, Region 6's Communications and Finance Coordinator, is providing technical assistance today, and he'll be keeping an eye on the questions with me. We'll queue up your questions and save them for our speaker to address at the end of the presentation. Please be sure to select everyone when posting your questions to the chat. Uh, you can do that by using the little carrot with the drop down menu, um, and that will ensure that both Miles and I see them. Closed caption has been enabled and it's available by clicking on the icon with the three dots and then selecting closed caption. We're recording today's session and we'll post it on NNLM's YouTube channel within a couple of weeks. At that time, everyone who registered for the webinar will receive an email with a link to the recording, so keep an eye out for that. This session is eligible for one Medical Library Association continuing education credit and one Consumer Health Information Specialist credit, which you'll be able to claim through the evaluation link and enrollment code that we'll share with you at the end of the session. And speaking of that evaluation, your feedback matters to us and helps us improve future trainings. So please take a moment to fill that out. As a reminder, by uh, registering for this webinar, all attendees have agreed to abide by the NNLM Code of Conduct to foster a respect respectable and professional learning environment. Because some of you may be first time attendees to an NNLM webinar, I'll share a bit about us. NLM, or the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources such as PubMed and Mudline Plus. NNLM, the network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM, working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. Today's session was organized by Region 6 as part of our Speaker Spotlight series. This series features expert guest speakers presenting on topics of interest to all our users including librarians, public health practitioners, educators, clinicians, and others who work with health information. You can learn about upcoming sessions by subscribing to our Region 6 newsletter, checking out our blog, or following us on Facebook or LinkedIn. It is my pleasure to announce our guest speaker today, April Johnson Stearns. April was diagnosed at 35 with stage three breast cancer that she found while breastfeeding her daughter. Four years later, while struggling to go back to normal and find other women in similar circumstances, April launched Wildfire magazine. Now, in addition to publishing the stories of those too young for breast cancer, she also finds pleasure in helping others heal through learning to write and share their stories. April lives with her family on the coast of Central California. So welcome, April. And with that, I'm going to turn off my camera and turn the session over to you. Thank you so much, Nora. I am so happy to be here with you all. I am um, really, really passionate about this topic of expressive writing. And so I am excited to talk to you about that today. 
As Nora just said, and you can see on my Zoom screen, my name is April Stearns. I am the founder and editor of Wildfire Magazine. And I am so passionate and excited about expressive writing because it is a tool that I have used personally and professionally. And I am really excited to give you some background on that and also tell you how you might use it as well. So I primarily use this with, as Nora said, with women who were diagnosed with breast cancer. I tend to focus my work on people who were diagnosed under 50, but expressive writing is a tool that can be used by anyone, anywhere, regardless of gender, regardless of illness, regardless of life experiences. It is available to everyone and it's really powerful. So I want to share with you a little bit of the ground that we're going to cover today as we get into this. So today you will learn what expressive writing is and about its history. You will gain a greater understanding of expressive writing's role in physical healing, and you will hear examples of how to facilitate this amongst your library patrons, your patients, your other people who are in your life, but maybe even yourself as well. And then as Nora said, as we go through the talk today, please be um, feel free to share your questions. I look forward to answering them at the end. So I just want to give you a little bit more information about me and how um, I came to do this work. So as I said, I am the founder and editor-in-chief of Wildfire Magazine and the writing coach behind Wildfire Writing Community. Wildfire is a digital and print magazine that I created in the aftermath of my own breast cancer diagnosis to amplify the stories of others, also diagnosed on the younger side. I wanted us to be able to find each other and also feel that power of storytelling to connect us to one another and to help us feel whole again after something as devastating as a cancer diagnosis. So I was diagnosed when I was 35. That came 11 years ago now. I had um, stage 3C invasive ductal breast cancer. So my treatment path included chemotherapy for five months, immunotherapy for a full 13 months, radiation, 35 rounds of radiation, as well as a single mastectomy, a unilateral mastectomy. And I opted to have aesthetic flat closure for my breast reconstruction. So one of the big parts of my cancer experience that that really impacted me was the aftermath. When I was going through treatment and going through uh, the diagnosis phase, um, that was a really, really big deal, obviously. And that year was very hard for me, but I found the hardest parts were picking up the pieces in the aftermath. So this is years two, three, four, five onward. I found those times to be even harder and likely because of when I was actually going through the treatment year and the diagnosis I had a guide I had a full medical team telling me where to go what to do I fully just turned myself over to them but on the other side of that treatment, when I was basically handed back my life and my body, I found that I was a completely changed person. I was utterly without an idea of how to move forward from that. So my mental health really, really suffered in those years. And at 35, I didn't know anyone else my age who was going through this, no one else amongst my colleagues, no one else in my family, my immediate family was experiencing this, no one else in the mom's groups that I was in. I felt utterly alone. And I really believed that if I just kept moving forward and just kept putting my head down, I would get back to that person that I was prior to my diagnosis. But I'm here to tell you, if you haven't experienced a major illness, that it really changes everything about you. It really changes everything. So I was struggling with identity, post-traumatic stress. My finances took a hit from that year of cancer treatment for sure. 
And I went straight into menopause. And so I was also dealing with infertility and the other effects of menopause on my marriage and just my ability to connect with others in the face of a constant anxiety about cancer reoccurrence. So even though I'd experienced this very physical of diagnosis and treatment, I found the effects, the aftermath to be, if not more so, at least equally as significant on my mental health. So I turned to writing to help me with that. I was using writing as a way of getting my fears out of my body and onto the page. And it also helped me to feel strong enough to have confidence about taking back my body and my health and having a say in it. And after going through a year of treatment where all of my health was dictated by someone else, that was something that I needed help with to feel qualified even to be the owner of this body and be the one who was looking out for other, you know, cancer recurrences or other just side effects of that cancer experience. So this is the work I do now, helping people use writing to do this, to have agency again in a situation that feels very out of control, to feel ownership of a body that was once turned over to, to a medical establishment, and just to make sense of what they have been through. And I'm really excited to share that with you guys today. So a little note on terminology. So expressive writing is the same as memoir, is the same as personal essay, is the same as personal narratives. You've probably heard all of these words before. And if you weren't familiar with ex expressive writing per se, just know that it is the same idea as all these things. It's just about writing the true stories of our experiences with the goal of processing. And certainly some people ultimately go on to publish those stories or share those stories in some way with a community. But at the core of it, it is about writing your way through an experience in order to make sense of it and to heal from that experience. So I want to now tell you a little bit more about the person who has really inspired my work. And I, you know, came to expressive writing kind of by instinct, but he has made it his career to study it. So I'm talking now about Dr. James Pennebaker, who is out of the University of Texas in Austin. And I want to tell you about the work that he did with realizing that expressive writing held the key to a lot of healing. So Dr. James Pennebaker is a social psychologist. And at this time, when he started to uncover this, it was in the 80s, and he was studying the body's physiological response to stress. And at that time, he stumbled upon a confession-related phenomenon that sparked decades of groundbreaking research. So it was called the polygraph confession effect. And I'm going to tell you a little about that. So Dr. Pennebaker had been invited to give a series of talks to top level polygraphers working for the FBI and the CIA. In late night conversations following these events, these experts really captured his interest with similar stories. So, for example, a bank vice president showed intense physiological stress while being questioned. But when he broke down and confessed to embezzlement, he became extraordinarily relaxed. And many of the polygraphers shared very similar observations with Dr. Pennebaker. So even while facing severe consequences, individuals felt liberated after confessing their actions. And I think we've heard more and more about this now. At that time, it was very surprising, but we've come to know this to be true. So through the 1980s, Dr. Pennebaker developed research supporting the idea that secrets contribute to physical illness. Specifically, he discovered that people who experienced trauma and kept it a secret were most to have health problems. This discovery led him to launch his studies using expressive writing. And about that, he wrote, if keeping a secret about a trauma was unhealthy, it made sense that having people reveal the secret would give improved health. And as a social psychologist, Dr. Pennebaker was concerned that asking people to 
share these traumatic events and stories out loud would be traumatizing to them. So by default, he asked them to write about these experiences. So he ran his seminal study using expressive writing in 1986. Over four days, the participants wrote continuously for 15 minutes, and the control group was instructed to write objectively about superficial topics. Meanwhile, participants in the experimental group were asked of, to share the most important or traumatic experience of their lives. And Dr. Panabaker's instructions, rather, went something like this. He said, for the next four days, I would like you to write your very deepest thoughts and feelings about the most traumatic experience of your entire life or an extremely important emotional issue. You might tie your topic to other parts of your life, your childhood, your relationships with others, your past, present, or future. All of your writing is confidential. Don't worry about selling your grammar or sentence structure. The only rule is that once you begin writing, you continue until the time is up. So Dr. Pennebaker's participants were stunned by these instructions, he said. He wrote, previously, virtually no one had ever encouraged them about some of the most significant experiences of their lives. Many students came out of the writing rooms in tears, but they kept coming back. And by the last day of the experiment, most reported that the experience had been profoundly important to them. So let's take a little step back here and talk about what expressive writing is. So at its very essence, it's very simple. Expressive writing is writing that comes from your core. It's personal, it's emotional, and it's writing without regard, like we said, to form or other writing conventions like spelling, grammar, etc. Expressive writing simply expresses what is on your mind and in your heart. Expressive writing plays particular attention to feelings more so than the facts of the story. We are most, most interested in how this made you feel. So like narrative writing, expressive writing may have an arc of a story, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sometimes expressive writing behaves like a story. It swells to a crest and resolves itself again. But often expressive writing is turbulent and unpredictable, and that is 100% okay. Expressive writing is not so much about what happened as how you feel about what happened. And in order to use expressive writing as a therapeutic tool, these are the kind of the three main parts about it that are important. So it should be prompt based. That gives the or it takes the weight off of just sitting before a blank page. And the prompt can be very specific or can be more open ended, as Dr. Pennebaker's was, where he just said, write about the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you. I'm going to give you some examples of writing prompts in a little bit here, but it should be prompt based. The second is that timer. So Dr. Pennebaker was using about 15 minutes. In my work, my prompts are anywhere from five to 20 minutes. And I truly believe that there is magic in that timer. And the reason for that is because most of us have an idea of what we think the right answer is to a question. I know I certainly do. Um, and so you experience this with other people when you give them a prompt, they have something they're used to saying or they have what they think is the right answer. So they jot that down, but then the timer is still ticking, right? They have still five minutes, eight minutes to go. What are they going to write? And it's on the other side of that stuff that they thought they were supposed to write, that they really start to tap into those deeper feelings, those deeper memories, or those questions that are still lingering. So the timer really allows for that to happen and come out. And so the idea is to keep writing the whole time. So those are the main components of using expressive writing as a healing tool. And so shifting back to Dr. Pennebaker, so he was really interested in what happened with individuals after they used expressive writing as a tool. So he tracked several measurements. His most striking finding was that relative to the control group, the experimental group made significantly fewer visits to the doctor in the following months. 
Dr. Pennebaker's results prompted hundreds of follow-up studies by his team and others, and they found evidence that people who practiced expressive writing experienced many benefits, including decreased anxiety, blood pressure, depression, muscle tension, pain, and stress. They also experienced enhanced lung and immune function and improved memory, sleep, quality, and social life. And they reported increased grades and work performance as well. So initially, Dr. Pennebaker attributed the benefits of writing to a cathartic effect. People confronted past traumatic events by expressing their difficult feelings, therefore they felt better. But he went on to discover that it was the writing that had real, real weight. And it was the writing that was kind of that afterthought um, or a side effect, you know, of these studies that he wanted to do. He wanted people to speak about and express these traumatic things, but he wanted to also protect them from having to say them out loud. So he gave them this tool of writing. And in that, he found that writing allowed people to go even deeper into their feelings and explore things that happened to them, which gave them the ability to create a path forward out of that trauma into the rest of their life. And that was significant. So Dr. Pennebaker proved that there's tremendous value to be had from stepping next to a trauma and kind of becoming the reporter of those things. So if you enjoy this kind of information, this kind of science behind the power of storytelling, in addition to checking out Dr. Pennebaker, I would encourage you to read a book that is by this woman, Alison Fallon. She compiles a lot of the science along with tools for using storytelling to change a life, prompts, things of that nature. That book is called The Power of Writing It Down. I have really enjoyed that book. So how did I learn all of this? Well, for me, this goes back before my breast cancer experience to about the age I was uh, in this Olin Mills photo shoot photo. Maybe some of you remember some of those Olin Mills photo shoots. This is me and my brother back in the 80s, 90s. And at that time, we were living with my mom who had a significant personality disorder. And her personality disorder made her violent and made living with her very challenging. So it was back in those days when I was a young teenager that I kind of just stumbled upon writing as a tool that would work for me. In that time, I felt very out of control of my life and things were happening around me that I didn't understand. Things were happening to me that I didn't understand. And so I found myself needing a safe place to have a voice for those things. I was not able to speak those things aloud. And so I instinctively turned to writing. So my dad worked for IBM. And we were a family that had a home PC computer. We had a whole desk set up outside my parents' bedroom. And at some point, my parents acquired a second PC computer, a giant PC computer. So my dad lugged this big thing down the stairs and into my bedroom and gave me our family computer that we had all named Harvey. Harvey had a huge monitor, you know, all everything about it was enormous, including the keyboard and including a dot matrix printer. So each night after a tumultuous day of just living with my mom and living in this environment, I found that I needed to pour all of my thoughts and feelings about my situation into that word processor on Harvey. So I pull up my desk and just bang out my feelings every night. And, and then I would print all of those things that I put into that word processor. And you can probably hear that screech of that dot matrix printer. So I would print everything out. Then I would tear that perforated, you know, those whole um, strips along the side of the paper. I would tear that off. I would three hole punch it. So ka-chunk, ka-chunk, getting those three holes into it. And then I would snap it into a three ring binder. And I felt so good getting it out of my body and into the page. 
Meanwhile, of course, my brother's on the other side of our bedroom wall, banging on that wall, being like, stop with the noise. It was so noisy, this process, but it was so cathartic for me. I didn't know why, but what I knew was that it was moving this story out of my body onto the page for one thing. Secondly, it was giving me a voice in a situation that felt very out of control where I couldn't raise my voice. And I was then able to sleep every night after I did that, I was able to sleep and then do it all again the next day. So it definitely refilled my cup and I attribute it to my surviving that situation. So then fast forward to my breast cancer diagnosis. When I was diagnosed, like I said, I had a young child. I discovered my lump one night while breastfeeding. And so what I remember about that time was my husband and my daughter eventually going to sleep each night and me sitting up late into the night consumed by fear, consumed by not only fear for my mortality, but also how was this cancer going to affect my relationship with my child? You know, would it drive a wedge between us that would be unbridgeable? I was worried about how it would affect my marriage. I was worried about what I didn't know to be worried about. Like I just had so much inside of me weighing me down and I could not sleep. And so again, I turned to writing and just pouring it out on the page. And again, I noticed that I was able to sleep after that. I was able to face another day and feel that I had the tools to make sure I was fostering that relationship with my daughter. I had the tools to make sure I was asking the questions that were weighing on me in my doctor's appointments. And I felt able to just continue to move forward and see that path forward. So in 2014, I attended my first actual writing workshop. This was in the town that I live in. It was in person and it was primarily women wanting to write their memoirs. These were primarily retired women. I was by far the youngest person there. But what brought us all into that room was a deep desire to write. And it turns out a desire to heal past traumas that it happened. Some of us had had cancer. Some of us had had divorce. Some of us had had other, you know, childhood experiences. And so what brought us all there was a deep desire to write it out. Whether we knew why or not, it was a powerful experience to write it out. So it was soon after that, that I decided to launch Wildfire Magazine to publish the stories of other people who were also using writing as a tool to move through their cancer experience. I knew at that time how cathartic it was for me to write, and I knew how cathartic it was for me to read the stories of others, but it still took a couple of years before I decided to help others write their stories. That for me came about in 2020, right when the pandemic was hitting, I was wondering how to help my community even more, how I could give them more connection to each other. How could I help them heal themselves when they were at home dealing with the cancer experience or the aftermath of cancer, you know, in this very scary time. And so I decided to launch a workshop and I didn't know if we would be able to connect virtually as well as I connected with that group when I went to that in-person writing workshop, but I really wanted to give it a try. And so to my joy and delight discovered that Zoom works quite well for connection as you're seeing here, like we are able to connect through the screen. And so I started offering writing workshops that are very similar in instruction to the ones that James Pennebaker was doing for his study. You know, I brought people into the room. I gave them writing prompts. I gave them a timer. I told them not to edit themselves, just to let it rip on the page. And from there, I've been doing writing workshops weekly, many times a week. I actually have four this week that I'm doing, um, but many times a week because the community has responded that they need that extra layer of healing. They're receiving this storyline, like I said, from a medical team and from experiencing how this story has affected them and wanting to make meaning of it and make um, a space to understand and heal from it. 
So I just wanted to share with you a couple of thoughts that participants of my workshops have had on this topic. So this is Lucy. She was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer at 47. And at the time of the workshop that she attended, she attended two actually, she was about a year past her diagnosis. And like me, she had been told that life would just go right back to normal. She was a busy flight attendant. She was flying all through her cancer treatment and she was just trying to be normal over her life. Fast forward a year later, she discovered that she really had some unresolved trauma from that. And that's what led her to a workshop with me and wildfire. So she said, the writing workshop gave me the release I desperately needed. And that was when I started to heal. I want to introduce you to Allison. Allison Greenberg was diagnosed with de novo stage four breast cancer when she was 41. And what brought her into the workshop initially was finding others with a similar diagnosis. Allison is a lawyer and wasn't used to using right write personal stories at all. But she said, as I cope with living with breast cancer, the community has brought me new friends and has made me enjoy writing even more. And then lastly, this is Julie. Julie was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer at 47. Julie was using writing as a hobby, primarily fiction and poetry, but hadn't really used expressive writing before. She said, I was surprised by the stories that came out of me during the workshop. I now have to write and further explore as I continue to make meaning of my lived experience in cancer land. So what I want to do now is give you some tools so you can do this for others in your community, whether these are library patrons, yourself, another aspect of your community. I want to give you this tool because it is so powerful. So firstly, you need to decide if you're going to offer this in person or virtually. As I said, I wasn't sure if it could work virtually, but it does very, very well. There's just different things to think about when you're setting it up. So for in-person, I would suggest supplying the paper and pens to people. Some people may choose to bring a laptop or other device to type on, but I find um, supplying the paper and the pens is helpful. I also tell people I have no preference whether they type or handwrite. I really think that that's kind of individual and people usually kind of know which one they want to use. Personally, for me, I find it helpful to use pen and paper in expressive writing only because when I type, I tend to want to correct myself and edit myself. It's just too easy. So I prefer long form writing, but I think that's just personal. And then I would also recommend if you're doing in-person writing that you have some ability to close a door or have some kind of seclusion so people feel safe. You are asking them to kind of expose themselves, right? They're being very vulnerable on the page and they need a safe space in which to do that. I remember one of the first in-person writing workshops I did was at a library. And unfortunately we had a parade of just other patrons kind of walking through this space. And so I learned from that experience that we needed our own room with a door where we could put a little sign that said, you know, writing in progress or something like that, just to give the people writing that sense of security. And then if you're going to do it virtual, I would just make use of the tools that are in Zoom or in Hangouts or wherever you're going to, to use it to have that waiting room. Again, you want to know who's coming into the space. You want your people to feel safe and that they are um, able to express themselves. The next thing you need is prompts. You um, can use a prompt as open-ended, as I said, like the Penna Baker prompt, just you know, write the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you. If you are gathering a group that has had a similar experience, you can use prompts that are more specific to that experience, say a cancer diagnosis. And I will give you some example prompts that you can use, but really any kind of open-ended question will bring that person into the page and then they can go wherever they want from there. But that initial prompt I find to be very essential. The timer, of course, is very important. Like we said, you need that 
kind of, I don't want to say pressure, but you need something to lean up against when you think you've already written everything you have to say on the topic to help you get on the other side of it. So have a timer, use time to prompts. Also, I find it is helpful to encourage people to share. I never require it, but I have found in my workshops that sharing your story aloud brings another layer to the healing, is another opportunity to move it further out of the body. I like to say that writing is the inhale and sharing is the exhale. But what I do to ensure that it is safe for people to share is I let them know I'm not recording the session in any way. I also advise the attendees to keep those stories in the room. And we don't make it a critique session. We don't tell anyone how they could write better or rearrange their story or even ask follow-up questions on their story. We just let them know that we hear them, we see them, and it resonates with us. I've also found that very helpful for just participants to see their own story reflected back from someone else who's reading aloud. So this sharing part is very cathartic. This is not something that Dr. Pennebaker was using in his studies. This is something else, but I find that it is really helpful. So if you can offer it, it's nice. Um, and usually I do have most everyone choose to share their stories. And it's interesting because in these kinds of workshops, you get a variety of people, some people who have used writing and know kind of like I did as a teen or a young adult, they know instinctively that when they write, they feel catharsis. But there are also other people such as um, my friend Allison, who I shared with you, who is a lawyer, they aren't used to using expressive writing tools, or they even will say, I hate writing, but they're here because something tells them that there's there's goodness on the other side of that. There's something they need in expressing that story. So all of these things help to make that a safe place, whether someone is experienced with expressive writing or not. The last thing I would suggest you do is if you can offer your writing workshops or your expressive writing workshops as a series as you recall, Dr. Pennebaker was doing 15 minute writing sessions four days in a row. That was how he structured his study. I, in Wildfire, use a six week series primarily with mine. And we usually meet weekly and we write for about an hour and a half and then have time for sharing in there. So we're covering about four prompts in that hour and a half. And I find that doing it in a series is really helpful because a lot of times people need kind of that warm up to who else is in the room with them, who else is, you know, sharing, gives them that permission to share their own story. But also sometimes people need repeated exposure to just expressive writing itself in order to finally get down to the thing they really wanted to say. I have Every single person who comes through my workshops experienced a cancer diagnosis. Every single one of them says they're there to write about cancer. But I often have participants who spend, you know, week one, week two, week three, writing about childhood memories or things in their marriage or other illnesses before they finally feel ready to write about that cancer diagnosis that was the thing that brought them in the room in the first place. So I think a repeated exposure through a series can be very helpful if you're able to offer something like that. So here are the rules that I give my participants that you might consider giving yours. I always let them know that there is no wrong or right answer to a prompt. A prompt is simply that starting point on the page. I want them to know that they can write about cancer or not. They can write about you know whatever they want to write about, even if they're just writing the prompt over and over again. And that goes to that second point of needing to write the whole time. I literally say to keep their hands moving the whole time, their fingers tapping, even if they're just writing the prompt or even if they're writing, I hate this prompt. I want them to just keep writing because I have never had it not happen that something will take off for them. Something will emerge onto the page if they just keep writing that whole time. 
So again, I really, really caution them not to worry about spelling, grammar, et cetera. This is not a class in school where you have to worry about those things. This is simply letting it out of their body. So I tell them that that editor part of that brain needs to take a back seat for this part. There's tons of time for editing later if they choose to share their writing elsewhere. But this is just stream of consciousness. This is just to get it down and out. And then again, I tell them this isn't so much about what happened, but how you feel about what happened. It's about moving away from those facts and drawing out their feelings. So I always give that um, permission, you know, to just be vulnerable. So here are a few writing prompts that you can use if you choose. Like I said, there's no real magic to the right prompt. It's just to give an entry point on the page to kind of give something open-ended that invites someone to write about something traumatic. So these are, I want to understand. I don't understand. I wish I knew. I can't stop thinking about. And I know the real truth about. Use those if you like, you can find your own prompts. There's lots and lots of sources of writing prompts on both the internet and just in books in general. Some are specifically expressive writing prompts and some are just writing prompts. Journaling prompts work great. There are fiction prompts like plot prompts that work really well. You can modify them a little bit to work for expressive writing. I also find that quotes work well too. So if you're a person who loves to find those inspirational quotes, sometimes those can be the perfect jumping off point because they stir some kind of reaction or some kind of emotion in your um, participants. But I would say, try these yourself, try these prompts or others that you find and see how you respond to them. It's really kind of personal on what prompt works. And I always tell my participants, I don't know where your stories are. I don't know what's going to be the perfect prompt to unlock it. So we'll just keep having exposure to different prompts until we find the one that kind of hits upon it for you. All right. So today we have been talking about expressive writing. I told you what expressive writing is, and we went into also the findings of James Pennebaker and that physical impact of writing on people's well-being. And we talked about how you can facilitate expressive writing with your library patrons and patients and with yourself. And so that brings me to the end. And I would love to um, ask Nora, ask Miles if we have any questions. Thank you, April. That was great. Um... Yeah, so now I'd like to open up the room for questions. We have a few already, but if you have more questions, um, please put them in the chat box and uh, we'll get to them. So um, the first question I see uh, says, is there research on the effects or value of rereading this kind of writing or of writing and then discarding it? That is an excellent question. I haven't come across writing specifically or studies specifically on rereading it. I've noticed just anecdotally in my own workshops that it's a little split. Some people just need to get it out and then don't need to revisit it. Other people keep all their notebooks and keep pouring over them. They take them to therapy sessions and share that writing with their therapist. Um, and sometimes then even want to turn it into a book or turn it into something bigger than that. And so it's helpful in that regard. Um, but unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't know if there have been studies on that specifically. And thank you, April. And then someone else says, do you use the same prompts for each session in a series? Oh, that's a really great question. I actually don't. I use different prompts in um, each session. Like I said, I don't really know where a person's story is or which prompt will unlock it for them. So I tend to vary it each session. And because I have repeat attendees quite frequently, I also change my prompts from session to session to session as well. 
But, you know, ultimately that just means I have a huge buildup of prompts and I can go back and recycle some eventually, but I am using these prompts myself. So I'm always on the hunt for what will unlock my own stories. And so for me, it's part of the fun is finding those new prompts um, things. So I do um, for each session. Great. And do you see a difference between expressive writing and personal journaling? don't actually I think that they have very much the same um the same thing at the core which is just getting down to feelings one of the things that I think helps with you know the healing aspect of this kind of writing is that you become an observer of your own story or you become a reporter of your own story so it's letting you step aside and when we sit down and journal we are essentially doing that we're recounting what happened in the day perhaps or you know an event and it's the same hallmark of expressive writing i would just say that sometimes in journaling you can stop at just the facts and so expressive writing would specifically encourage you to make sure that it includes those feelings as well yeah um we've got two questions that are somewhat similar. One person asks, are you a trained therapist? If not, how do you handle situations in which they need more professional help? Yeah, I am not a trained therapist. So I always explain that in my workshops that I am not and encourage people that if they need additional help around healing that storyline, or we uncover something that is, you know, very triggering for them, that they do seek that help. I also find that when people ultimately come to a writing workshop, they are ready to kind of do that work. And so for that reason, it does sometimes take people a long time. I have people sometimes arrive in a writing workshop many years after their diagnosis, whether it's a metastatic diagnosis or an early stage, it's just taken that long to get to that point of being able to look at it. I also always encourage them if, if they go down a path with their writing that feels too sensitive, they have the power to turn back. They don't need to keep going with it. So yeah, I am not a therapist, but I definitely encourage them to use caution and listen to themselves and also seek that outside therapy. Okay. Um, the other question was just if you have to deal with liability and disclaimer issues, um, for instance, stating that that's this is not therapy, which maybe you just answered. Yeah, that, exactly that. I just um, say that I haven't had any problem with that um, at all. I also, um, you know, in terms of publishing people's stories, I don't fact check their stories by any means because we are a memoir, memoir based publication. Um, I do trust everyone that is telling the story that it is their story to tell and it is focused on them. I don't publish stories that are written about other people, but that's primarily because that's not memoir. That's you know, that's writing about someone else. So I think um, I am sensitive to that liability issue, but so far it hasn't been an issue because I've been very upfront about what I'm doing. And on a similar note, someone says, we are not mental health professionals, and this could bring up a lot of emotions and trauma when shared. How would you recommend offering support in, the, in these difficult moments for your students without being an actual mental health professional? Yeah, again, I think it's really important to give those resources and to tell people that this is heavy work that they're doing. One of the things I like so much about writing is that it is free and available to everyone. So some people who aren't able to access other forms of therapy can access writing. But like you said, I mean, sometimes people definitely need more care around that. And I just give them those resources and encourage them to do that for themselves. I have been in therapy since um, I was a teenager. So I'm a big, big, big fan of that work too. Um, someone says, I run a hybrid journaling for mental health program at the library I work with and do much of the, the list minus the timer. I do keep time, but it's kind of loose. Is the timer you use available for the participants to see? That's a great question. So I just this year started using a timer that is available. Um, this, the way that you're seeing this uh, slide on the screen for me is through a program called Prezi. And Prezi is the software that I use to do my writing workshops. And it includes a timer that I can either show 
to the participants or not. And so I choose to show it to them. What I was doing before was giving them some kind of a warning or heads up when we were nearing the end of the time, I would come on and say, you know, one minute to go. And I would also say, you know, that doesn't mean hurry up or anything like that. I'm just letting you know where we are. I always let people know that 10 minutes, 15 minutes, often isn't enough time to get a whole story out. And so I would just say our goal isn't a completed story by any means. We're just using this, you know, prompt and time as an entry point onto it. Um, I had a little bit of feedback that some people found it a little jarring when my discombobulated voice would come in and say a minute ago. And so that's why I started showing them the prompt or the time rather and just letting them know where we are. I also always show them the prompt on the screen too. You know, I say it out loud and then I leave it on the screen. So they have something to look at as they're writing. And so in combination, I find that those two things really help um, people to keep going with the prompt. Great. looks like we, we have quite a few more questions. So I love everybody's questions. I'm going back and forth between the Q&A and the chat. So if I haven't gotten to yours yet, I will. Um, Someone asked, how young age-wise did Dr. Pennebaker include in his study? Has the writing helped others in just learning to write uh, if they never really wrote in school? Yeah, what a great question. So I actually don't know how young those individuals were in um, Dr. Pennebaker's study. He has written a couple of books. I would really recommend checking those out um, for more on his studies. I got the impression um, in my research initially, I, you know, I have this idea that they were adults because um, they talked about returning to work and feelings of well-being and marriages and things like that. So I don't know how young they were. I do know that expressive writing tools have been used with teenagers, um, teenagers who've had cancer and teenagers who've had other experiences. Um, maybe it would work well with children. Um, I haven't done that myself, so I don't know what kinds of tools would be needed to that accessible for really young children, but I think teenagers definitely have that capacity and, and young adults onward. Um, Nora, can you remind me what the second part of the question was? Um, second part of the question was, sorry, that one yeah, went away. Sorry about if that. they never really wrote in school. So, yeah, absolutely. I find that this kind of writing is a great way for someone to kind of enter into writing because it is so immediately rewarding to get personal stories out onto the page. You're writing about something you have knowledge of. You're writing about yourself and something that happened to you. So there's no research required. Like I find that some people find this to be very um, freeing from the types of writing they maybe did in school for maybe the story they have in their head about what writing is once they realize that they have within them all the right answers you know this goes back to people being concerned about having the right answer to a prompt but once they realize that they have it within them that there's no focus on spelling or anything like that they feel free to write and then yes absolutely just that practice you know that regular returning to that kind of writing is going to improve the writing and I have found that expressed to me in my workshops that a lot of people who didn't think they were writers find that they are eager to write and then find the craft improving as they just have repeated exposure to it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, along the same line, someone asks, um, what other tools can I use if writing is difficult for some? Oh, you know, there are lots of um, benefits to using just art as a therapy tool as well, or to work through an experience. So um, I've often combined writing with art in workshops, but some people feel much more comfortable with um, just being able to do that, just being able to put some paint or some doodles or something like that on a page to just start that process of kind of moving it out. It can be as simple as like, what color is your trauma? Or what color is this experience of yours? And you can just start there. Um, there's music that is very helpful for people as well. Um, hiking guided hikes and things like that. I've been heard work very well. I personally only have a lot of experience with writing, but I think that there is a lot of things under that kind of header of healing arts that you might want to look into. 
Great. And then someone asks, have any of your workshop attendees tried to publish their memoirs or become professional writers? If so, how have they prepared for criticism or feedback uh, on how to improve their writing? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I, um, being a publisher myself, have had the joy and pleasure of publishing many people who have come through my workshops who realize that they did like that cathartic effect of sharing their story and sharing it out. What I always tell them is, you know, start with an audience that you connect with. And so, you know, in this example, if a person is writing in a wildfire writing workshop and then I publish them in Wildfire Magazine, they're kind of just, you know, speaking to the choir a little bit and they're sharing their experience with people who understand it, resonate with it. And, you know, of course, everyone has different experiences and different ideas around that. But what I tell them is to, um, I use the phrase writing a story from wound to scar. And that's the thing I learned from listening to the Moth Radio Hour, which is all about telling true stories on this stage. And in order to share a story that can be consumed by, you know, a public or an audience, like you said, you do have to be prepared for um, either some criticism or just comment. And so I always tell people, as you're going through this process of writing it, you will develop kind of a scar tissue around your story where it comes less traumatic. And it's that process of continuing the expressive writing tools and the journaling tools that move it to this new state for you. It's a little bit like how a story can become almost dreamlike the more you tell it and it loses some of its teeth. And so writing from a wound where it's very open and, um, you know, gory, I guess, for lack of a better word, and then moving it to a state where you've told it enough times, you've written it enough times, you're not crying every time you write it, you start to build up this scar tissue, then you start to be able to conceive of it being out in the world. And so it's this long process of going through, I think, just that writing of it. It's not one and done. You can write your story many, many times to build that up. And then for me in Wildfire, I also offer people other workshops to get more into that storytelling craft and the more of the tools of storytelling in order to share a story in a way that will elevate someone else's experience. And in the process of that, they are getting ready for that kind of exposure. And we do gentle group critique and things like that, um, just to help people be ready to, to share it in that way. I hope that answered that question. Um, we have one question that says, do you know about research or examples of workshops like this offered in other languages or cultural contexts? Perhaps Dr. Pennebaker has more info in his books need to look him up. Like people who provide, prefer to write in their preferred language or perhaps working with interpreters in a mixed language setting or any other accessibility related pro tips slash lesson learned you'd like to share from your experience. Thanks. Yeah, I really appreciate that question and unfortunately don't have a lot of answers personally to that. I think, like you said, I would definitely look up um, Dr. Pennebaker's work to see if that was something that he touched on. Alison Fallon in her book, um, The Power of Writing It Down, I think does get into some accessibility issues. I, um, I, I only speak English, so I only do my workshops in English. Um, so I haven't really experienced people wanting to write in another language, but I would think this would work extremely well for that. I do have people come into my workshops who English is a second language. And so they kind of flip back and forth between, you know, the language that feels right in that moment. My whole goal is just, you know, whatever you need to do to get it out and down, you should do that. So I think it would absolutely work. I just don't have a really clear example or, or tip for you on that. And I know we're, we're almost at the end of the hour and I want to make sure to get everybody their continuing education credits um, and everything. So I think we have time for one more quick question, which is that someone said, are you aware of bibliotherapy? How might this pair with reading for healing? Bibliotherapy is reading, reading therapy. I love that. That is a new one for me. I love that. Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm not as uh, familiar with that. I just instinctively am reading all the time myself and encouraging my writers to read because I think you 
improve your own writing by reading, but you also get that cathartic feeling of having someone else's experience kind of mirror aspects of your own. So I think that Biblio theory um, sounds like it goes perfectly with expressive writing. Absolutely. Well, thank you, April. That was wonderful. I so enjoyed hearing uh, your presentation and everyone's questions. I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, so before we wrap up, I want you to encourage I want to encourage you to join NNLM. Uh, you may have created an account to register for the webinar, but membership is organizational, not individual, and it's free. It includes benefits such as funding opportunities and print resources. Um, be sure to sign up for one or more of our newsletters to stay up to date on upcoming training opportunities, funding announcements, resources, and more. You can also uh, explore upcoming webinars and classes on the NNLM training website, which is listed right here, nnlm.gov training. The link for the class evaluation is on this slide, um, and we'll put it in the chat box as well. We found it works best to copy and paste it into a browser rather than directly clicking on the link. And here's the enrollment code that you'll need to enter when obtaining your CE credit. That's right there on the screen as well, reg 61023. Um, and we'll also share that in the chat box. So um, that brings us to the end of today's presentation. And I want to thank you all for being here and wish you a, a good rest of your day. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.